In this video, we're going to look at prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. You could take all the cells on the planet and split them up into one of these two groups. And if we look at the name, it gives us some information about what these two groups mean. <clears throat> Cary means nucleus, and pro means before. So prokaryotic cells before the nucleus. These are primitive cells and they do not have nuclei. U means true. So eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus. And uh, if we can look at these two pictures we can see some of the similarities and differences. Both types have a plasma membrane, both types have a cytoplasm, and both have DNA. The main difference is that in a prokaryotic cell, the DNA is found free in the cytoplasm. It is kind of in a region though, and they call that the nucleoid region, or nucleus-like region, but it's not a true membrane-bound nucleus like we have in eukaryotic cells. You'll also see both cell types have ribosomes for making proteins. One small difference is the ribosomes are larger in eukaryotic cells. Also notice the size of the cells. Prokaryotes are smaller. They only go up to about 10 micrometers. Now with prokaryotic cells, really what we're talking about is bacteria. And eukaryotic cells, these would be our animal cells, our plant cells, also fungal cells, and you might think that eukaryotes would be the most diverse group based on that. There seems to be a big difference between an animal cell and say a fungal cell, <clears throat> but in fact the most diverse group is the prokaryotic cells. If you were to look at bacteria all over the planet you'd find a, a huge range in the, in the DNA that they have, and so they are a more diverse group. Some of the other differences that I want to draw your atten attention to. Membrane-bound organelles are absent in prokaryotes. What's a membrane-bound organelle? Well, that's just an organelle with a membrane around it. And these would include lysosomes, Golgi complex, or sometimes called Golgi apparatus, the ER, the mitochondria, chloroplasts. I'm sure you've heard of these organelles before. They all have membranes around them, and therefore they're only found in eukaryotes. Also, um, how they divide. Prokaryotic cells literally divide in two. Binary means two. Fission means splitting. And they make genetically identical copies of themselves. In eukaryotic cells, the process of mitosis makes genetically identical daughter cells as well. So how do you get genetic diversity if, if both of these processes result in genetically identical cells? Well, they do carry out sexual reproduction. And um, if you learned nothing else from this video, you will learn that bacteria carry out sexual reproduction. That's very exciting. <clears throat> Uh, two bacteria will line up next to each other and they build a conjugation tube between them. And through that conjugation tube they transfer their genetic material, which is DNA. In eukaryotic cells, a process called meiosis occurs, which you studied back in grade 9. Meiosis results in gametes which are the sex cells, also called sperm and egg. Um, now the IB program uses E. coli as the representative prokaryote, so we're going to look at E. coli in more detail. <clears throat> Here's an image of E. coli with some of its ultrastructure labeled, and we'll look at the ultrastructure in more detail. First we have the pili. The pili are these hair-like projections. Pili is plural for pilus or 
pilus, I'm not really sure. But these hair-like projections are used for attaching to other bacteria so that they can exchange genetic material. They also have flagella, these long appendages which rotate like a propeller and are for movement. They have a plasma membrane which is selectively permeable. They have a cytoplasm and they have a cell wall. The cell wall is chemically different from the cell wall of a plant or the cell wall of a, a fungus. Their cell wall is for protection, it helps the bacteria maintain its shape, and it prevents osmotic lysis. Osmotic lysis is the bursting of a cell due to osmotic pressure. It's something we'll learn about in the next unit, but water tends to flow into the bacteria, and that's because there's a higher solute concentration inside the bacteria. So with all that water flowing in, it has the potential to burst. That's osmotic lysis. But the cell wall prevents that from happening. There's the nucleoid region, which contains the naked DNA. Um, naked DNA, and that's called naked because it has no proteins attached to it. And it's not no chromosomes. Chromosomes are DNA combined with protein. And that's what we have in our nuclei. Prokaryotes don't. And ribosomes for protein synthesis. You are responsible for recognizing the organelles in an electron micrograph of E. coli. This is taken with an electron microscope. Uh, notice there's no pili or flagella visible here. Oh, maybe there is some pili there. It's a little hard to see, but you can see some of the organelles there. And this slide is showing how a bacteria divides by binary fission. So the first step is for DNA to make a copy of itself. And then a cross wall is formed between the two copies of DNA. Eventually the cell splits at that point and you get two genetically identical daughter cells. The eukaryotic cells, <clears throat> which you're probably a bit more familiar with. Um, so first of all, they contain ribosomes. <clears throat> so we're going to look at each of these organelles in a little bit more detail now. Uh, the ribosomes, they're also found in prokaryotes, but in eukaryotes, you might find ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. And then in that case, it would be called rough ER. You might also find ribosomes floating freely in the cytoplasm. Here's an electron micrograph. All these little black dots are ribosomes attached to ER. And ribosomes, again, are for making proteins. Um, so here is a drawing of the rough ER, and I want you to notice how it is attached to the nucleus. <clears throat> the membrane of the nucleus is continuous with the membrane of the ER. And if it's studded with ribosomes, it's involved in protein production, and it's called rough ER. And then over here you have ER that doesn't have ribosomes on it, and that's called smooth ER and that is for lipid production, which we'll see in a minute. <clears throat> Here's a micrograph which shows the nucleus here, and all of this rough ER all through here. This is all rough ER. So the smooth ER produces lipids, which includes oils and steroids. Well, steroids are, are hormones like testosterone, uh, rough ER, as mentioned before, is involved in the production of proteins. <clears throat> it also is a factory for the cell membrane. So you might want to think about where these two types of ER might be distributed in the body. So for example, if there's a part of the body that makes a lot of steroid hormone like testosterone, you would expect to see more smooth ER in those cells. 
<clears throat> if it's a part of the body that makes lots of protein, you might expect to see more rough ER. Lysosomes, uh, sometimes called the digestive system of the cell, they contain hydrolytic enzymes for digesting material. And that could be material that's coming into the cell to be eaten as food. It could also be parts of the cell that are damaged. The lysosome will help to break that down and digest it. Uh, one interesting fact about lysosomes is um, like a tadpole's tail. When the tadpole loses its tail and becomes a frog, the tail doesn't just break off, it actually gets digested by the lysosomes inside the frog cells. Next we have the Golgi apparatus, which is responsible for packaging the protein. So this is especially important for those proteins that are going to leave the cell and be secreted. And those proteins get surrounded by a vesicle. These are vesicles. So you'll find lots of vesicles around the Golgi apparatus. Oh, by the way, sometimes it's called Golgi apparatus, sometimes Golgi body, sometimes Golgi complex. It's all the same thing, and that's one of the reasons why you love biology. There's a micrograph of the Golgi apparatus. Plant versus animal cells. Um, some organelles that we don't find in an animal cell, but we find in a plant cell, would include the chloroplast for photosynthesis, a large vacuole in the middle, and this large vacuole squeezes the nucleus over to the side of the cell. Um, also the cell wall around the outside. Um, organelles that are found in animal cells but not plant cells would be the centrioles which are involved in cell division, um, the lysosome, although this is uh, hotly contested among cell biologists, but um, some textbooks will tell you that lysosomes are only found in animal cells and not plant cells. Now finally, there are some components that are found outside of the cell, but attached to the cell. So extra on the outside, extracellular components. Example would be the cell wall. The cell wall is not considered an organelle. Uh, it helps the cell maintain its shape. It prevents uh, too much water from being taken up. And in a plant, it helps hold the plant up against the force of gravity. So here's an example. This is a cell wall in a plant that has been given water. And so the central vacuole fills up with water and exerts pressure on the inside of the cell and it helps to keep the cell rigid and it helps to keep the plant standing up straight. This pressure is called turgor pressure. You can sort of imagine like a, a water balloon inside of a flimsy box. If the balloon is, is filled up, it helps to keep the box rigid. When there's not enough water, the vacuole shrinks and we get a flaccid cell and a wilted plant. Um, in animal cells, the extracellular components that uh, you're responsible for is this matrix, an extracellular matrix. And this is made up of glycoproteins. Um, glyco refers to carbohydrate. So these are, these are proteins with carbohydrate chains on them, called glycoproteins. Um, they work for support, adhesion, and movement.